Hi, these notes are over 3, 5, overlapping triangles, and 3, 6, types of triangles. Your central question for 3, 5 is how can I use overlapping triangles in proofs? So something that you always need to remember when you see the pictures for these proofs is that sometimes the triangles might overlap and they can kind of be hidden in the picture. So a couple things you can do you can either highlight the true triangles with different colors, or you can redraw them separated to distinguish them. All right, let's try an example. If you take a look at this picture, depending on how you look at it, you can count up to about eight triangles. So since this whole chapter is about congruent triangles for the most part, we know we're gonna need some triangles that could possibly be congruent but how do we know which ones to look at? Um, let's start off by looking at our givens. Um, we're gonna label our givens on our picture to see what we've got to see what triangles we might wanna pick out. B is the midpoint of segment AC. Therefore, I know that BC and BA are gonna be congruent. And we can state that in a little bit if we need to. E is the midpoint of AD. Therefore, AE and ED are gonna be congruent. Angle seven is congruent to angle eight. These are both outside of any of the triangles. And angle ECD is congruent to angle BDC. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, the only thing that I can see that really is congruent that would possibly be part of two triangles would be those last two angles that we just looked at. Um, if you kind of look at this, let me highlight these for you. If you look at this angle right here, it's a part of this triangle. And if we look at, let's see, if we look at this angle right here, which is congruent to that angle ECD, that's part of this triangle. So we've already got two or two corresponding parts that are congruent. One pair of corresponding parts. If you also check it out, both triangles overlap between C and D. So we could possibly say that these might be the two triangles that we want to look at right in here. So you can highlight it kind of like I did, but sometimes it's even better to redraw those two triangles to kind of separate them. So if, they, if I redraw the green triangle, it might look like this. I've got B here, C here, D here. And I would also want to put the markings that I see on it. I had one tick here, I had two ticks here, or two arcs here. The other triangle kind of looks like a reflection of that, and that is triangle ECD. It looks like this. Got E, C, D. And again, I want to label it and mark it with the same ticks. So I've got two ticks here, two arcs here, and I know that they both share CD, so in a little bit I'll probably want to state that CD is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. Somehow I need to state that these two triangles are congruent. Um, I've already got an angle and a side, which means I either need to say an other angle or another side, either ASA or SAS. To look at two sides that would be congruent, it would have to be BD and EC. So I'm not sure that I know enough information. Now I do know something about angles seven and eight. Um, those are outside of the triangles. So I'm thinking, and that's right here and over here, those might help me to somehow say that 
this angle right in here and this angle right in here are congruent because these are um, supplementary to congruent angles. So I could kind of use ASA to prove these two triangles congruent. After that, I'll have to figure out what I need to do. If you look at our proof statement, we're trying to prove that segment AC is congruent to AD. And if you look at AC and AD, they've both been bisected by midpoints B and E. So I could possibly use CPCTC to state that you know this part, BC and ED are congruent, and then by the multiplication property, multiply those by two to show that AC and AD are congruent. So I kind of have a plan here. Just kind of need to clean up my page just a little bit. Okay, so what we talked about already, we already know that angle uh, ECD and angle BDC are congruent. That's a given. So that's going to be one of our A's. Um, we said that we could say that CD is congruent to CD itself by the reflexive property. So let's go ahead and state that. And that would be a side. So put an S out to the side to stay organized. Remember, these are congruent statements I'm going to use to prove those two triangles are congruent, the ones that I redrew. And then we also talked about showing um, that angle BCD is congruent to angle EDC because they are both supplementary to angles 7 and 8. Remember where angles 7 and 8 were. This was angle 7, this was angle 8, and we know from our givens that those are congruent. If those are congruent, then their supplements, which are the two angles I just said, are going to be congruent. So we could state that those are congruent. Angle BCD is congruent to angle EDC and that would be my third letter, my A. So I could now state that these two triangles are congruent by ASA. But first I need to say the reason. <laughs> so the reason that these two angles were congruent was if angles are supplementary to congruent angles, they are congruent. If angles supplementary to congruent angles, they are congruent. Okay, now by ASA, I can state that those two triangles are congruent. So it doesn't really matter what we call the first triangle, we could call it DBC if we want. But when we name the second triangle, the letters need to correspond. D corresponds with C. Remember, these are reflections of each other. B corresponds with E, and C corresponds with D. So it's going to be angle or triangle CED. And that's by ASA. Okay. So remember what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that segment AC and AD are congruent. The two parts of these triangles that belong to AC and AD are BC right here and ED here. Right now I have them as possibly not being congruent, but because I know these two triangles are completely congruent, by CPCTC, we can state that they also have to be congruent. BC is congruent to ED. And then I can go back to my picture and change those one ticks to two ticks. So, oh my goodness, this half, this half, this half, and this half are all congruent. So now I'm able to say, by the multiplication property, I'm going to take these two congruent halves, I'm going to double them, and I'll get this multiple and this multiple, AC and AD. 
Those are congruent by the multiplication property. And there you have it. So sometimes it's kind of hard to figure which triangles for my picture I'm going to be using because they might be kind of hidden or overlapping. Look at your givens, try to figure out, you know, based off my givens, which triangles would be easiest to prove congruent. And then once you've got those congruent triangles, you can prove that by CBCTC other parts on them are congruent, and hopefully that will then help you to prove whatever it is that you're trying to state. The second section is over 3.6 types of triangles. Your essential question is, how can I classify and use attributes of various triangles in proofs and find missing angle measures and side lengths? There are two ways to classify triangles. We can classify them by side lengths or by angle measures. If we're looking at just their side lengths, the three classifications are equilateral, isosceles, and scalene. And this is probably a review from junior high. Equilateral triangles are when all sides are congruent. And I can see that by the one tick mark in all three sides. In an isosceles triangle, at least two sides are congruent, which means an equilateral triangle is also isosceles. Isosceles triangles have some special parts too. The two sides that are congruent, these are called the legs. These two guys. The side that is not congruent with the other two, this is called the base. The angles also have special names. The angle between the two legs, this is called the vertex angle. And then the two angles on either side of the base, these two guys, these are called the base angles. Okay. Uh, we jump over to scalene. Scalene is when all three sides have different lengths. So basically there are no congruent sides. We can also classify triangles by their angle measures and ignore their sides. There are four types of classifications by angle measures. The first is equilateral, and that's where all angles are congruent. Something you may or may not know is if you add up all of the angle measures inside of a triangle, they, they always equal 180. So if all three angles have to be congruent, that means they actually all equal 60 degrees. So that's something to just remember about equiangular triangles. Something else that's special about equiangular triangles is they also happen to be equilateral. So equilateral triangles are equiangular and equiangular triangles are equilateral. Next we have a right triangle, and this is a triangle that has one right angle. It's actually impossible to have two right angles um, because in a right triangle or in a triangle because two right angles already add up to 180, which means the third angle would have to be zero degrees, which isn't going to be an angle. So there's only can be one right angle in a triangle. Remember, a right angle equals 90 degrees. You learned a lot about right triangles back in junior high. There are some special parts to right triangles that you might want to remember. The long side that's across from the right angle, this is called the hypotenuse. And then the other two sides that are on either side of the right triangle, those are called the legs. All right, we, got, we also have a third classification, and that is an obtuse triangle. There can only be one obtuse angle. That's this guy right here. And if you remember what obtuse means, it means that it is greater than 90 degrees. 
not equal to, not less than, but greater. Um, then we have an acute triangle, and that means that all the angles are acute. They're all less than 90 degrees. Okay, so let's try an example using these ideas of the different kinds of triangles. It says, if triangle VSY is isosceles, that means at least two of its sides are congruent, and its perimeter is less than 45 units, which side is the base? So remember, the base is the side that is not congruent to the other two that are congruent. So what we know, we've got an expression for each side. At this point, we don't know which two sides are congruent, but we do know that the perimeter, if we add them all up, it's going to be less than 45. So let's go ahead and set up an inequality to represent that. Just add up the sides. 10 plus x plus 7 plus 2x minus 8 is less than 45 units. We're going to solve this just like we would an equation for the most part. If we combine our like terms, we've got 1x and 2x, which make 3x. If we combine our constants, 10 plus 7 is 17, minus 8 is 9. So 3x plus 9 is less than 45. Then we would subtract 9 from both sides. And 3x would be less than 36. And the last step would be to divide both sides by 3, which would give us an x value that was less than 12. Okay, so we need to remember that. The value of x must be less than 12. So now what we're going to do is we're going to consider the three different scenarios. Um, the three different scenarios are this. Vs could equal... Vy, those could be the two that were congruent, or Vs could equal Sy, or Sy could equal Vy. So we're going to set up three equations and solve them and just see what we get for x, see if we can figure this out. So if Vs equals Vy, then that means 10 equals x plus 7. If we subtract 7 from both sides, that means x equals 3. Okay, well, that could be possible because x must be less than 12, so if x is 3, that's possible. We'll come back to this one in just a moment. Let's consider the second scenario, Vs equals Sy. Vs is 10, Sy is 2x minus 8. If we solve this, we're going to add 8 to both sides which will give us 18 is equal to 2x, and we divide both sides by 2, we get that x equals 9. This also might be possible since 9 is less than 12. So we'll come back to this scenario in a minute. The third scenario could be that sy and vy are the two sides that are congruent. 2x minus 8 equals x plus 7. So to solve this, we would subtract x from both sides. x minus 8 equals 7. And then if we add 8 to both sides, we get x equals 15. Now, we learned from our inequality that x must be less than 12. So this scenario is not going to work out for us. Let's go back and check out the other two. Okay, so when x is 3, Vs and Vy were congruent. So let's go ahead and plug in x for 3 with using 3 into all three sides. Vs would equal 10. Vy would be x plus 7 or 3 plus 7, so it would be 10. And if I plug in 3 into 2x minus 8 for x, 2 times 3 is 6 minus 8 is going to give me a negative 2. Well, unfortunately, I cannot have a side that has a negative length, so this scenario is also out. It's got to be the middle scenario, but we're going to need to evaluate each side when x equals 9 
to figure out which side is the oddball or the base. So Vs is 10, right? We know that. Vy is x plus 7, or in this case, 9 plus 7, which would be 16. And then Sy is 2x minus 8, or 2 times 9 minus 8. 2 times 9 is 18 minus 8 is going to give me another 10. So my sides are 10, 16, and 10. My side that was 16 is the one that's not congruent to the others, and that was Vy. So therefore, Vy is my base. And it has a length of 16, whereas the other two sides that are congruent both have a length of 10. So we could mark our triangle like this. This is the side that is 16, and then these two sides are 10. And that's, that's what you got. Okay, so that's it. If you would like to start or attempt the practice problems, here they are for 3.5. They are numbers 3 through 5, 9, 11, and 12. And for 3.6, they are 9, 10, 13, and 14. See you later.